Living a life of intention starts within. Dora and I are excited to help you find the path to co-mindfulness living through our co-mindfulness masterclass. Our seven co-mindfulness principles will take you on a remarkable path towards health and happiness. For more information and to sign up for the masterclass, visit comindfulnessproject.com. People are yearning for information, having the opportunity to encourage people and to educate people and inspire people. It's amazing to be able to say we'll carve out time to take care of ourselves. There's something for everyone. Tony Powell is our guest today on Health Gig. We loved getting to know Tony and we know you will too. Dubbed a 21st century Renaissance man by the Washington Post, Tony is a choreographer, composer, painter, sculptor, photographer, filmmaker, graphic designer, and writer. He's the graduate of the Juilliard School and directed his own dance company, Tony Powell Music and Movement, for 10 years. He is a native Washingtonian, and we think we can safely say that you definitely have seen Tony's amazing work as a photographer. His work is everywhere in D.C., on the cover of Washington Life, Arena Stage Productions, National Geographic, not to mention a zillion photos of very recognizable people, all the way from Pope Francis to very famous movie stars to U.S. presidents and regular people, too. We're going to talk about Tony's amazing career, his artistic gifts, and his successes. We are also going to talk about resilience and about being faced with life-altering situations and learning to dig deep really deep to discover your own strength and courage. Tony does this every day. Welcome to Health Gig, Tony. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be here. We're so excited to talk to you today about so many different things, but we thought we'd start by asking about your remarkable career in the arts. How did you get into the arts and when did it all begin? It was really a stroke of luck. My mom and dad had the foresight to move out of D.C. to try to have a, you know, a better life for me and my brother out here in the suburbs. And so we moved from D.C. to Montgomery County when I was nine. When I was a student at Chevy Chase Elementary School, that actually that first year when I was in fourth grade there at Chevy Chase, an outreach performance was brought to the school from Howard University, they came and gave a kind of an outreach performance of singing and dancing and acting. And at the end of this kind of a school-wide assembly program, they asked all of the students to get up and dance to this music that they put on. I can still remember it. It was wonderful. It was, I was just having fun. I was just, you know, dancing to the music and the director of the entire department, he spotted me. And about an hour later, they called me to the office. I was in my classroom and over the loudspeaker, someone said, would Anthony Powell please come to the office? And I thought that I had done something wrong. I thought that I, I, that I hadn't done anything. I was thinking, what, what did I do? And so I came to the office. I met with the director of the Howard University Drama Department. And he asked me if I would be interested in auditioning for a show that was going all across Europe a Broadway musical that had just left Broadway and was going to Europe. I found myself just a month or so or two later, and I was in Switzerland, Germany, and Paris performing Raisin that had just left Broadway. It was the, the musical version of the play Raisin in the Sun. It had just left Broadway and got to see every opera house all across Europe, and it was just wonderful. It was the most important artistic experience of my life because within this one production, as a young nine-year-old, I was watching how... The orchestra, and I was playing music by then. I was already playing the piano at that point as a young child at six or seven. And by the time I got to Europe and saw an actual orchestra rehearsing, because we produced an album as a result of this production, I got to watch as a kid. They just, you know, I wasn't a part of the orchestra, but I was able to sit in on all of these sessions and watch this, you know, 70 piece orchestra. I got to, to, to see how the winds and the strings and the brass and the percussion all came together. And I saw the conductor and I would emulate him and I would just imitate his movements. And I just, I knew that this was something that, that I could do. And I knew it was inside of me because I was already playing music. And I thought, well, maybe I don't want to just play music. Maybe I want to write it. Maybe I want to have other people play what's in my head. And that's what happened later on. And I look back to that experience because I was also a dancer. I got to watch this incredible choreographer, Al Perryman, who's no longer with us, one of the first casualties of the AIDS epidemic. This uh, guy, Al Perryman, was a wonderful choreographer and role model in terms of his professionalism. He was such a good 
artist, and I remember this as a kid, he was so kind to me and we would often together go and do these kind of press junkets and things together where he would demonstrate some choreography and I would do a little dance because my character actually had a couple of dancing moments in the show. And so we would often go to do a magazine interview or something together. He was a very good person, but I got to watch how he worked with, you know, 30 dancers. And that became something that I did later on in my life. I made, you know, over a hundred ballets for different ballet companies all over the world. And that experience even though it didn't happen at the time, it planted the seed in me to know that I could write music, that I could be a choreographer, that I could be a dancer, that I could be a singer. That one experience, I think I would have to say, was the fountainhead for me in terms of just realizing that there could be a career doing what I love so much, which is whatever it was, writing, painting. I'm also a painter. It's one of my paintings behind me here. Oh, wow. Uh, all of it's the same for me, whether it's a painting, a piece of music, a dance, a piece of poetry, a symphony, it's really all the same. It's about, you know, putting these disparate elements together to, to make a cohesive whole. So that's what I learned as a child. Well, Tony, everything you're telling us is so incredible. Were you just born this way with these amazing gifts? All I know is that once I saw these things, and this is why I think it's so important to expose children to the arts, I have four children myself, and from an early age, I took them to the ballet, I took them to the theater, I took them to hear live music, I made sure they saw paintings, I've taken my children to the Louvre in Paris, to Musée d'Orsay, I made sure that they saw that creativity is probably what most civilizations will be remembered by. <laughs> you know, the things that artists have produced. When we look back at the Renaissance, we don't think about mundane things. We think about the beautiful paintings and sculptures that were left behind by, you know, Leonardo and Michelangelo and these great artists. We don't think about other things. We, we really look at what they left behind artistically, you know, culturally. I try to expose them to all these things to give them a well-roundedness that I don't think they would get another way unless they've actually gone and experienced these things. When you went to Europe, did your parents go with you? No, I had a chaperone. I, there were 100 dancers, singers, and musicians with this performance, you know, with the orchestra and the, and the actors and dancers, and they all came from Howard University. We had five main stars from New York. They were opera singers and actors uh, that, that played my mom and dad and my grandma. The cast came from New York, professional artists from New York, and the dancers and the orchestra all came from college students at Howard University, but they were all incredible artists already in college and many of them have gone on to do amazing things over the years. My mom and dad were not with me for the six months that I was in Europe. They came for two weeks, but I had a chaperone. It was amazing to be away from my family and to see the world uh, <laughs> through the eyes of a nine-year-old with no mom and dad around, you know, so it was pretty amazing. Did your parents expose you to the arts in the same way that you're exposing your own children? I have to tell you, my dad, who's not doing so well now with dementia, but he shoved a trumpet in my hand when I was a very young child <laughs> because he played the trumpet when he was in the Air Force. My dad was a musician, and he told me he did it to make enough money to buy beer. That was his, <laughs> his story. But he exposed me to music at a very early age. I remember the first sounds that I could remember were Duke Ellington and Count Basie in my home and Frank Sinatra and just these wonderful artists. And then that sparked my interest. And then I remember at 10 years old, 10 and 11, bringing home from the library symphonies of Mozart, fugues and canons of Bach. I would actually check these things out. At that time, we had record players. You know, most people don't know what those are anymore. But I would take the records home from the library, and I was just obsessed with these pieces of music. And I had a wonderful aunt, my father's oldest sister, who's now 96. She bought me an entire encyclopedia, one of the old times when they actually went door to door and, and would sell you an entire encyclopedia with 20 or so books. And those books were the things that I just, I retreated. My mom was an immigrant. We were Brazilian. My mom didn't speak English so well, so I didn't really have that great kind of communication ability with my mom. And my dad was a workaholic. And so I was often left, you know, on my own. And I retreated into this world of really just learning. And I'm just so grateful to my aunt. An incredible gift was that encyclopedia set because I went through that thing from A to Z and back again many times, often getting stuck in art and often getting stuck in P for painting and M for music, but going through the entire thing nonetheless. A really important part of my upbringing was being able to have this resource to really see what was really out there. Out of curiosity, is your brother a musician as well? 
he's about as left brain as they come, <laughs> you know, but I'm so grateful for that because we are a great contrast. We balance yes. each other out. But I have a lot of that too. I was blessed with that side as well. But the right side has definitely dominated for most of my life. So what was the next step in your life? Was it when you were accepted to Juilliard? It was only going to be two places. I wanted to be an architect. So again, all of the arts for me are the same. So whether that's putting metal, glass, concrete together to make a house, it's the same thing as putting sounds together to make a symphony or orchestral instruments together to make an incredible kind of a tapestry of sound. It's all the same. And so I had either wanted to go to architecture school or I wanted to go to Juilliard. The Juilliard application came back first, and that's where I ended up going. And it was the most just incredible learning experience, but also one of the most difficult times at the end of my career at Juilliard. It was very difficult. I had really discovered kind of a seedier side of Manhattan, <laughs> but drugs and alcohol. And what started off as something very fun early on in my first few years of college that everybody did. You know, many of us knew each other. We all hung out and we all just were having a good time. Many of those people could wake up and then get to school the next day and do what they needed to do. But by my fourth year of college, I didn't realize how sick I had become from the disease of addiction. I hadn't realized it. Instead of going to classes, I was now skipping school to do drugs and to drink all day and really had no idea just how bad it was until I actually got kicked out of Juilliard. They allowed me to stay. My mom and dad had to come the next day from Washington, and it was just a terrible time. And they basically said, if you can do this, this, and this, we'll let you stay. And I stayed, but I got so drunk during my graduation exams, I couldn't pull it off. And I wasn't able to graduate from Juilliard at that time. I had two professors. One is still living, one is passed on that really, really championed me. And I care about them greatly to this day in my heart because they went back and they were kind enough. Once they knew I got sober, they were kind enough to petition Juilliard to allow me to come back to get my degree. And they had never done that before. This was something that was unheard of. They'd never done this before. And so I was allowed to come back after five years. I got to live with the very, very famous Russian choreographer, Anna Sokolo. The great Anna Sokolo was in Martha Graham's first company. This was the great choreographer, Martha Graham. She was in her first company and developed her own career in Manhattan, considered one of the most important modern dance choreographers of all time. And I was blessed to get to live with her when I came back to Juilliard to finish my degree in 1995. And I'm just so grateful that they allowed me to come back because that was one of the first times I could really see a correlation between sobriety and achievement. I had had this terrible experience with being battered down by the addiction. In the years just after being let go from Juilliard, I'd already felt so bad about myself and being able to get sober and to get that degree was just really a, a ray of hope, a ray of sunlight. And it showed me that when I'm walking that path, there are only two paths, one of good and one of not so good, <laughs> you know? And if I'm really doing that good thing, that one that's pointing me towards the light, the beneficent light, that's what I'll call it, that, that beneficent path. When I'm walking that path, the options are just endless. But I will tell you, when I'm walking that other path, when I'm not doing so well and I'm harming myself and I'm harming others, I mean, the snowball is just so quick. It's awful. But now that I'm on this side of things, I can just see how each new day, life just gets better and better and better with this way of living. I had to start losing things to realize just how valuable life was. And I didn't stay sober. I got my degree and started a company and within five years I was drinking again and lost everything once then and then got it all back and then lost it one more time as if the first time wasn't bad enough. I really had to see what it was like to really lose access to my children, my wife. I was married at that point. I started a ballet company and I wrote all the music and did the choreography and the photography and everything, all the grant writing. It was a very successful company for almost a decade. And I met one of my dancers, my principal dancer, she and I started having children, we got married, and it was a beautiful love story there, but it was punctuated with all of this sickness, with this alcoholism and new children being born and hospitalizations and rehab and detox and psych wards. And, you know, we were talking yesterday. She and I are the best of friends now, but she couldn't handle it. She just got to be too much for her. And after 17 years, you know, she couldn't handle it any longer. And 
I lost everything. She left, my kids were taken away, my business was shut down, my parents wouldn't let me back into their home, I had no place to go, all of my money was gone, I had used it on drugs and alcohol and squandered it on, you know, hotels and women and all kinds of things, and that was it, it was over. And I had just been written about in the Washington Post, I thought, okay, now I can take a drink successfully, (laughs) you know, now I can have a drink. I rested on my laurels and thought that with this adulation, I could now somehow safely drink. With someone who has what I have, you know, one drink will kill me. It may not be that one drink that I take at that moment, but eventually it will catch up and I will die from this disease. And so I had to lose everything just to see how beautiful life is today. And I'm just so grateful that I have a new child. My fourth child has never seen me drink. I'll be 12 years sober, God willing, in a few months. And this is just the greatest thing that's ever happened in my life. But I I had to lose absolutely everything to get everything back and to have this incredible solid foundation on which to live now that I wouldn't have had had I had it any other way. And the universe is beautiful that way. You know, some people curse the universe. They want to shake a fist at the universe. But everything literally, when I look back and I see, oh, that's why that happened. It's all been beautifully planned out. It's all been perfectly released to me in a way. I thank the universe daily. And this is the way I live now with the way I eat. I've been a very, very strict vegan for a long time now and mostly raw. This is my prayer back to the universe, like we were talking about the other day. This is my prayer back, that thanking the universe for this incredible life, for this opportunity to share with you all what it was like and what it's like now in hopes that maybe someone can hear this and it'll benefit them. This is really why we're doing any of this, you know, I believe is to help others. That's what I was missing for so many years. I was missing that component, helping others. I read that when you began drinking again in 2002, you said it was like a river bursting through a dam that all hell broke loose. It's so funny. And so I say in 2002, I'd already been to so many treatments and detoxes over the years by that point. But what was so different about 2002 was I had just had a company come from Chicago to do one of my works. My own company performed three or four of my ballets. I had a live symphony playing one of my pieces of music. It was just probably the greatest culmination of all of my work in one place at one time at the Kennedy Center here in DC. And it was sold out and it was just standing room only. And when that last piece of music played, that last note, that last dance step, the entire audience was on their feet within seconds. And there was this feeling of, wow, okay, now I'm okay. And I've had to learn, and this has been life's journey for me, that when I tie my worth, my value, my esteem, so to speak, when I tie that to the opinions or something external outside of me, I'm easily manipulatable. But when I find that source of security and strength inside, when I find that within myself, I'm not affected by anything outside of me. For me, that has been this life's journey, is to overcome myself and to realize that the only work that has to be done is the work with inside of me. I've spent most of my life trying to change my children, trying to change my wife, my employers, my parents. It's absolutely the most futile thing you could possibly do when the answer is looking within. The answer is realizing or trying to figure out why do I need that external validation? Where does that come from? And I had to do this work, this very, very deep work in the steps of a 12-step program that I'm affiliated with that really got me to start looking and taking an objective look at myself and to see why are all these things so challenging for me? Why do I have these resentments? Why do I have these fears? These were things I never wanted to talk about because my father growing up told me, you know, you don't discuss that. You know, I had a very straight shooting dad, wore a gun on his hip my entire life. He was career law enforcement. Crying was not encouraged (laughs) at any time and showing feelings wasn't encouraged. That's totally opposite to who I am today. I think the most important thing I can do is to tell someone how I'm feeling. You know, the sensitivity I see in my children is my greatest gift that I've passed on to them, I believe. You know, is that they're able to feel and to have empathy for others and compassion. And these are things that, you know, you can't pay for. You either have them or you don't. 
you can get to them if you learn to do this work to clear away a lot of this conditioning that you've been raised with. I was raised with that conditioning and thank God I was able to work with others to see that and to have it removed so I can actually be an open channel to be available to others, to be helpful, to be kind today. You know, I wasn't a kind person when I was drinking. This is all new territory for me and it's the most beautiful frontier there is. Tony, what do you think caused this sickness, as you call it? Was it chemical or loneliness or something else? I've actually had a psychiatrist once in a treatment center. I've never seen a psychiatrist outside of the treatment environment. When you go into a treatment center, if you've been drinking a lot, you look depressed when you're not drinking. When you get in there, you don't have your alcohol, you're shaking like a leaf, you're very withdrawn, and you look depressed. But once that's gone in a couple of days, I had a psychiatrist tell me once in Laurel, Maryland, at a place called Reality House. I was at this treatment center and he told me, he said, you know, most people wish they had what you have. I said, well, what's that? He says, you know, you have something called hypomania. I said, well, what's that? And he said, you know, you're not manic and you have probably never been depressed. I was like, no, I've never been depressed a day in my life. He says, but your mood is always elevated. You need very little sleep. You are able to get lots and lots of things done in short periods of time. You're constantly thinking about the next thing. I said, yeah. And he says, well, this is why some people with your condition sometimes like to crash and they crash and come down from that heightened state by self-medicating. I was like, oh, that's a nice piece of information I didn't you know, have about myself. But he said, don't worry, many famous people have had it. <laughs> he says, Thomas Edison had it. You know, Many people have had it who wouldn't sleep for days to create something. And that's what I had. I mean, when you're writing a piece of music, I've written pieces where I didn't go to bed for a day. You know, I'm just spending an entire night working through the night and continuing to the next day. I've done that editing on the computer photography for, you know, nine or 10 hours without stopping. It's just a part of who I am, coupled with the fact that my father and all of his brothers and sisters were carrying the gene for alcoholism. And so when you tax that predisposition for alcoholism, it's literally like a freight train. It's not if it will happen, it's how soon it's going to happen, because I can take a drink and maybe nothing will happen that day, but I'll start thinking about it. And I have a disease that it's in my mind and I'll start to obsess. I'll say, well, that wasn't so bad. I can get away with it and then I'll have another. And then when I have that second one, I'll want 25 more. And then it's off to the races doing other things that are really even worse than the drinking. So, I mean, that's just been my situation. So what do you do to crash now? I go to Jamaica for 10 days. <laughs> <laughs> I went to Mexico for 10 days before that last month. But even on vacation, I take my computer and I'm always working and photographing and exploring, but in a much more creative, more relaxed environment. That's one way. But the most important way I relax today is daily meditation has changed my life. I was exposed to meditation. I'm also a practicing Buddhist. Through the 12-step program that I'm a part of, one of the key components is meditation and prayer there as well. So it was a wonderful blending of the two things, the Buddhism and this 12-step program, that really showed me that when there are spiritual principles out there, you know that they're really spiritual because they never contradict each other. That showed me that these two things can cohabitate at the same time, the Buddhism and also this 12-step program. It's just changed my life. I can't describe it any other way. I used to be one way, and with the help of a power that I call the universe, the source of everything, the source of all, source energy, with this discovery of that presence's availability to me, I have discovered that the options are limitless. The sky's the limit. Do you feel like you accept you know, what is, or is it still a work in progress? I'll say this one thing about the word acceptance. And for me, this has been a very, very, very important realization for me. When I say that I accept something, what I'm really saying is that I don't like what's going on, but I'm going to have to learn to deal with it that I'm going to have to accept it. So that supposes that there's something wrong outside of me. So stay with me one second. So when I say I accept something, that means that I believe somewhere inside that something's wrong outside of me. So I have shifted completely. I've had a complete shift from accepting to letting be. In Buddhism, we talk about letting be, which is very different than accepting. Acceptance means that I somehow think something's wrong. And now, as a result of all of this work and the teachings that I follow, I realize that nothing is out of place. Absolutely everything is for my benefit. That shift is the most profound shift that's taken place in my entire life. I've gone from things happening to me to everything happening for me. And I can't explain it any other way. 
other than to say that my arms are open, my heart is open, and I actually embrace what shows up because I believe that this universe just has the best in store for me and wants me to have the best. And even when there are very uncomfortable things that happen, you know, emotionally or physically, you know, loss of, of a relationship or not getting something that I think that I should have teaches me that I have to learn to want what I already have and what I'm getting. And that's the shift. When I think that I should have that, that's pure desire. And, and in Buddhism, we talk about people only suffer when you crave, when you think you have to have something or a thing, a person, a situation, something. And when you cling to it, you suffer because it's not going to ever be the way you expect it in your mind. So pure suffering comes from attachment and reaching and pulling and grabbing at something. Nirvana or bliss or whatever you want to call it, enlightenment comes from opening the palm, from non-attachment, from just observing and watching and realizing that things come and go and love them for, you know, it's like a flower. If someone gives you a vase filled with flowers. Are you going to not love the flowers less because you know they're going to die in three days? No, you probably love the flowers more because you realize they won't be there for a long period of time. And it's the same with anything else. Why would I then think that a relationship is going to last in eternity? It's like that vase of flowers. It may last until we pass on, or it may just be for a season or a year or three. But when someone comes into my life, I express gratitude for that. And when someone wants to leave my life, it's the exact same gratitude. It's the acknowledgement of this moment in time that we got to share together. That's what love is. Love's not holding on to someone and trying to make them stay when they don't want to be there or me wanting to stay to make somebody else happy. That's not love either. You know, real love is appreciating who someone is for the time that you have with them. And then if they leave, realizing that this was the universe's opportunity to give you something that you needed to get to the next level of development, emotionally and spiritually. And so that's how I view everything today. That's what I was going to say about acceptance. <laughs> this idea that there's nothing to accept. Life is, and I have to either learn to let it be what it's going to be, or I'm going to be in a lot of pain because things don't show up always the way I'd like for them to show up. And I'm still reminded because I am not Yoda floating three inches off the ground here, you know? I will tell you that more often than not, I recover almost immediately from these feelings of, oh, I should have had that, or why didn't I get that phone call, or why, why, why? Why is the least spiritual question there is? Allowing is where I've shifted. Just allow and to watch and to see what it brings up inside of me. Paying attention, not judging anything that's coming up inside of me. That's the discipline. That's the practice to simply watch and not to judge what comes up. I'm really good at beating myself up. You could try, but no one beats me up better than me. <laughs> no one. <laughs> so when I learn to watch that voice that comes up sometimes and wants to tell me things about myself, I realize it is just thinking, thinking, thinking. And I do that. It's a part of my meditation. As I meditate and negative thoughts come in, as I'm meditating, I watch it and just kind of call it what it is. Oh, that's just thinking, thinking, thinking. And then guess what happens? It disappears. It's like a cloud passing along the horizon. It comes and it goes. And when I learn not to attach to anything that's in my purview, I'm free. But the second I attach to an emotion, a person, an idea, a situation, I suffer because it never stays the way I would like it to stay. So I'm learning not to have a way. And when I don't have a way, I am constantly surprised and amazed at how beautiful life can be. That's where it is. But when I need my relationship to go this way or my career to go that way, or I need to have an extra zero on the end of my bank account, whatever it is, I'm trying to dictate what's going on outside of me instead of just allowing what's happening to lead me to the next thing to do. I just do the next thing that shows up. I got a call and said, hey, would you like to do this podcast? And I'm thinking, this must be for my benefit. And now I get a chance to meet you two and to hear myself talking about these things only helps me and hopefully helps someone else. I get a chance to really reaffirm these things that have literally changed my life. So I can really say thank you, <laughs> really. You mentioned earlier that you strive to serve others. And one thing that Dora and I have heard you say is that kindness is an antidote one of the things that we can do to help stop the suffering. Can you talk about that a little bit? When all else fails, smile at somebody, be kind to someone, try to do something and not even let them know about it. These are little things that I thought were just so stupid when I first, I was like, why would you do that? You know, no, I'm mad at them. I want them to feel how mad I am at them. 
But in those times when I do have a resentment in the past, I don't have them today, I quickly deal with them as they show up. But when I have had very deep resentment towards someone, I was taught to pray for them, to wish for them all the things I wish for myself. In Buddhism, we call it metta, where we constantly are wishing joy to others and ourselves and peace to others and to ourselves and prosperity for ourselves and for others. And it has nothing to do with the other person. This is what I'm getting at. It has nothing to do with them. When I say this prayer for the other person, guess who it's really helping? It's helping me. It's nothing to do with them. But this exuding love and exuding kindness is the most powerful thing I can do. It is free. I can love all day long. I can give all the love I have away and it's the only thing in life that I can give away and then have more of. It is the only thing. If there's something else out there, please tell me. I have not found it yet. <laughs> but I just give it away and to my children, to my girlfriend, to my family, to my employees. I just give it away. And guess what? I end up having more of it. There's nothing better than that. I'm a numbers guy now, you know. I'm really big into profit and loss and, and risk and reward. And it's the least amount of risk, the least amount of risk for the most maximum reward you can have, knowing that you are open and free. That freedom you can't put a price on. Tony, I know this podcast is going to help so many people. And my question is, what advice would you give to families who are going through the same things that you've been through? What I will say, and it's hard to hear this for some people who are going through this, I will say it's a family disease. It's easy to point a finger at that identified alcoholic or drug addict, but generally, and this has been my experience, I work with hundreds of alcoholics and their families over the years. There's usually one parent that allows the behavior to continue because they're afraid that something's going to happen to the kid and or another parent who is the opposite and who is very, very controlling and unkind about the situation. You've got this dance that takes place in families, lots of secrecy. And what I would suggest is if the entire family has a part to play, and, and I'm not pointing a finger at anyone, I'm simply saying that if there's someone really sick in a family, that sickness radiates outward and affects everyone else. And if a family can see that maybe there is some possibility to go and get help as a family unit, to see that there is a family component to it, then I think everyone gets better. But when I think I'm okay, you're the one that has the problem, oh, but I'm buying your alcohol for you? If I'm the one that's still supporting you and letting you live in the house, what I'm trying to say is everyone has their part to play. If people see that this is not a moral disease, it's not a moral disease, it's not about being bad or good. It's not about, if only you were a good person, you wouldn't have this disease. It has nothing to do with that. This is a chemical, physiological, biochemical disease. It's a spiritual disease as well. Would you be mad at somebody for getting cancer? This is a disease. You wouldn't be angry at someone for having diabetes, but you may get upset with that person if they didn't take their medication, if they didn't take what was prescribed for their treatment. And that's the same thing with alcoholism. This is a primary disease. It's not the symptom of another thing. It is primary. It is the disease itself, is the disease. It has symptoms, but it's not a part of something else. Realizing that it is a medical condition and it can be treated, but if the family can unify and come together to see how they can also be supportive instead of isolating the individual who has the disease, that's when I think there can be really, really great progress in families. And sometimes I have to say it, you know, nothing changed for me until all avenues were closed for me. When my wife kept taking me back over and over and over again, there was no incentive to stop. But when my wife left me for good, when my parents shut the door on me, when my kids were taken away, when I had no more money, my businesses were shut down, and I literally had nothing, only then was I able to see that, wow, I really have to take a look at myself because I'd been pointing a finger at everybody else as being the cause of what was going on in my life. And now I realize that, wow, in every one of those situations with my kids, my wife, my employers, and now I'm an employer now myself, I have employees. In all of these situations, I'm the common denominator. It's up to me to try to get better, but I need my family to come along for the ride. And I have to tell you, you know, my family, God bless them, were so supportive. My mom would drive me to meetings and she would take me to the hospital and to different places to try to get me help. You know, she's gone to these family classes and just to get more information about what possible role they could be playing in this situation. And I certainly am not saying any of this to point a finger at anybody at all. I just assuring my experience is that when everyone sees that they may contribute to 
this dynamic, then everyone can get well. But if just one person gets well, what can happen, especially in a marriage, if just the alcoholic gets better, but the wife who's been enabling the whole time or who has been the opposite, who's been unkind and mean the entire time, now that the alcoholic is sober or vice versa, it could be the woman that's the, I mean, it could be any scenario. Once that person gets well, the relationship tends to fall apart because both people haven't gotten the help they need to move forward together. One has kind of been stunted. And that's usually the person that's resistant to going to get any type of help to see what their part may have been or to see how they can use some of this stuff that's out there, resources for them to get better and to approach the person that's now sober and, you know, move forward happily as a couple. And I've seen it over and over again. One gets better, the other one doesn't, the relationship falls apart. I've seen it happen many times. People are so lucky to have you there supporting them. Obviously, it's, you're very passionate about it. And what a gift you are to so many people. And your energy is so wonderful. And we are beyond thrilled to share you with our listeners. We thank you for being on Health Can't Give. Will you come back so we can continue the conversation? I would love that. I would love that. It's been a real privilege for me. Thank you for joining us on Health Gig. We loved having you with us. We hope you'll tune in again next week. In the meantime, be sure to like and subscribe to this podcast and follow us on healthgigpod.com. I'm Trisha. And I'm Doro. Be well. To learn more on how to live a co-mindfulness life, visit comindfulnessproject.com.